BJTs and MOSFETs are the most common type of transistor that you're just going to interact with in a breadboard. And in the most common simple arrangements like this, where you're driving the base or gate and you've got the collector or drain driving a load, whether it's a signal load or whatever, in the very simple switching arrangement, they're basically the same thing. They basically operate in the same way for digital and analog signals. The difference is in how switching happens. In a BJT, you've got cutoff, where there's no base current and there's no collector current. Then you've got saturation, where you've got maximum base current, maximum collector current, and then you've got the active area where it's a relation between. It's not linear. Ideally, it would be linear, but data sheets have curves. So as you turn up and down the voltage, you turn up and down the current, the, the current goes up and down on the collector. But the thing is, if you rapidly switch a BJT off and on and off and on and off and on, then it's going to be drawing power and not drawing power and drawing power and not drawing power. And if you turn it up and down and up and down with a smooth sine wave or something, then it'll take more and less and more or less. And the amount of power it draws is going to be directly proportional to the signal. So you're going to have a sine wave of current just as you have a sine wave of voltage through the resistor. More base voltage, more base current, because it's just, you know, do you have enough voltage to bias it on? And then it's based on the resistor. A MOSFET is different, and we think of MOSFETs as low power because they are. You're always going to have a trickle of base current unless you have an absolutely immense resistor here. If you have an immense resistor, you can get this current down really low, nowhere near a MOSFET. But you can have a minuscule base current, but you have less noise immunity, you have, you know, a resistance to switching because more resistance is, you know, lag, basically. So you get worse frequency response. But a MOSFET doesn't have that problem because of the way the, the, the field effect stuff works. So you don't have a gate resistor and this, you know, you have filter and, and ringing and stuff if you get fancy, but there's no need for it. It naturally limits the current and operates just fine if you're not worried about noise and crap. But here's the thing. A MOSFET can still draw power. In fact, it can draw more than a BJT. It can actually draw more current because a MOSFET has capacitance on the gate. It's not like there's a little capacitor in there, but there is capacitance in the way that a MOSFET works. When you change the voltage on the gate of a MOSFET, there is capacitance that charges to that new voltage and that draws power. And you can put a resistor and make it an RC network and then your RC time determines frequency response. But if you have no resistor, then it's just, you know, milliohms or less of the actual wires and it'll just charge and discharge as fast as possible. Usually that's fine because the capacitor is also absolutely minuscule. It's little itty bitty. So, you know, oh, it's, it's drawing, you know, 800 million amps. No, it's not, but you know what I mean. I'm exaggerating for effect. It draws as much current as it possibly can for a split of a split of a split of a second. So we don't actually care. And so MOSFETs are lower power than BJTs because if you have a BJT, you know, if you apply a digital high, you just apply max signal, then it's going to be drawing current the entire time through the base. If you apply a max signal to a MOSFET and leave it there, it's going to be drawing almost zero. You know, there's not going to be any actual current going through it. There'll just be the leakage that everything has. Capacitors leak, everything leaks. But if you discount the leakage that ideally wouldn't even be there, that's absolutely zero. Absolutely zero ideal current goes through the MOSFET. But when you switch a BJT extremely rapidly, it draws power on high, doesn't draw power on low, draws, doesn't draw, and so it just averages half the power. If you change the frequency, it does not change the power draw. So if you've got a square wave, 50% duty cycle, it's just high, low, high, low, high, low, evenly. It doesn't matter the frequency. Over time, the BJT is going to constantly draw exactly the same current because it's on for half the time, off for half the time. The same as if you put half the voltage through or whatever the midpoint of current draw is. But the MOSFET, every time you switch, that capacitance has to charge and discharge. So the higher the frequency, the more current it draws until it'll draw more than a BJT. And here's the thing. Here's what got me to think about this. Because I was working with a CMOS chip. And I haven't even thought about this till now. Because I just, I'm learning on the breadboard. But all of a sudden, I was thinking about low power solutions. I was specifically using a CMOS chip for low power. And I plug it in. I hadn't done anything. I applied the VCC and ground pins. I didn't plug in a single pin. It was drawing 6 milliamps. A CMOS hex inverter was drawing 6 milliamps idle. I'm like, what? 
And then I was like, oh, the switching frequency, because there's noise. Noise in the air. And sure enough, as soon as I grounded all the input pins, zero milliamps. So that's something to keep in mind as a reminder that MOSFETs draw power when they switch. BJTs draw power all the time, if they're on. So it depends on your frequency. So with a BJT, there is a minimum current through the base. You really don't need to worry about this with a BJT chip. In like super, super sensitive hardware, you might, but you'd probably be using MOSFETs then. But if there's noise on the input of a BJT chip, that noise could generate voltages definitely able to turn on this transistor, but there's not gonna be a lot of power there. There have to be, you know, lightning strikes near your building, or not even that, inverse square. You're not going to have so much power in just static electricity and radio waves inducting flying around your room. So it doesn't matter if it's turning this on, if it's on for a picosecond, because there's six electrons managed to make it through. But with the MOSFET chip, it will matter, because the signal goes high or low, it doesn't matter the current in the gate. It doesn't matter those six electrons are trying to get through. What matters is the voltage, which causes the MOSFET to draw power from its supply. The signal is not supplying this power, at least not with my chip. Maybe there are chips that would draw this power from the pin, but I extremely doubt it because they're supposed to be extremely high impedance pins. You don't want to load a signal source. So the chip I'm working with, simple hex inverter CMOS, the power supply connected to the hex inverter supplies the gate and its capacitance to switch. So you got this tiny itty bitty little noise with no power behind it at all that a BJT, it'd be like a, a bird trying to move a boulder. But the MOSFET is more like the bird tries to move the boulder and the giant comes over and is like, let me help you with that. So the signal isn't doing the switching. But enough of that. Let me just quickly show you this thing in action. So I have on this board a hex inverter, CD4069. CMOS, six inverters on one chip. Right now, my power supply is set at 5 volts, and it's indicating that 6 milliamps are being drawn. I have my multimeter plugged in, and it's actually showing about 3.5-ish milliamps, because that power supply is made of the finest chinesium, and this is a slightly more stable chinesium alloy. But right now, I have all 6 inputs of the CMOS chip plugged into a rail together, but nothing's connected to them. So, so they're connected together in this rail, but there's nothing there. So they're all floating. And you can see that there is fluctuation. In fact, you can I can make it wiggle a reasonable amount just by being near it every time the noise makes the pin switch. Here is a wire that's connected to that rail. Here it is in the air. Nothing happening. Let me touch the wire. All of a sudden, both are reading zero. Let me untouch it, and it goes back to normal. When I'm touching it, my body is acting as an effective ground because, you know, I'm... Essentially, there's so much capacitance in me, there's just so much of me, that any noise is being evenly distributed through my finger and hand and whatever, even though I'm not technically a conductor. But it's just such a stable ground that it's not detecting a switch, so it's not drawing power. And if I let go, then it's just loose in the air. And if I plug it into the actual circuit ground and let go completely, you can see it's also zero. If I plug it into high instead of low, it's zero. But when it's loose in the air, it's drawing about that. And we're getting about the same number every time because my sources of noise, the biggest sources of noise, are not really changing. The oscilloscope, the wall power supply, any stray EM from them, from my camera maybe, radio and television frequencies through the air. It's all basically not changing that much. Got a little antenna. That's all it is. As a final demonstration, I have a square wave. I have now plugged in the wave generator of my oscilloscope. It's generating a square wave at 100 millihertz, just because that's as low as it goes. 100 millihertz, once every 10 seconds. Well, once every five seconds, because if it's 100, well, here, let me just turn it to one hertz. There, one hertz. Now the math is easier. One hertz wavelength, half a second high, half a second low. There. You know, two thirds of people can't do simple math, but the other half are pretty good at it. So it's just a zero to five volt square wave, 50% duty cycle, one hertz. Let me start turning it up. And let me turn this down now to the microamp setting, so zero microamps. Let's turn it up until I see a microamp on my multimeter. One microamp. We are at eight kilohertz. Oh, now it's up to two, so I'll turn it down a little bit. So it's a steady one. Seven kilohertz. And the multimeter is registering one and sometimes two microamps. Let's give it another shot. Now we're at 18 microamps. We're at 77 kilohertz. You can see 
18 microamps from just the switching. This is not a huge amount, but then I want you to think about how many transistors are in your modern CPU, how many of them are in your actual chip casing, and the frequencies they work at. Ha ha ha, we have issues. But a single chip, six inputs, so all six inputs now, divide this by six, because all six inputs are getting the square wave. Let's keep turning it up. Let's go up to 500 kilohertz, half a megahertz, 120 microamps being drawn through the chip, all six inputs at this rate. Let's keep turning it up. This can register 2000 microamps before overamping. So if we go, right now we're at about half a milliamp, 2.1 megahertz, half a milliamp. Let's go to one milliamp. One entire milliamp, four megahertz. Let me turn my meter up. And let's just go all the way. So now I am at 10 megahertz, the maximum that this wave generator can put out, because this is a, you know, is a little baby oscilloscope, despite the fact that it costs nearly $1,000, is a little baby, because oscilloscopes are really fancy. <laughs> That's reading 7 milliamps, this is reading 2.5. But anyway, about 2.5 milliamps, oh here, this is more accurate, about 2.6 actually, on the more accurate setting, 10 megahertz square wave. So it's actually switching at 20 megahertz, you know, high and low, half the wavelength. So it's switching at 20 megahertz with a square wave frequency of 10 megahertz, six inputs. So is this a problem? No, it's not a problem. But if I unplug the signal, we had a 10 megahertz, look at this now, we had a 10 megahertz signal switching at 20 megahertz between high and low. We were drawing 2.6. Now we're at 3.5 from noise. So do you need to do this to get a correct result? No. Your chip is not malfunctioning. Your inputs are plenty isolated and will give you the correct answer every single time. This is, I mean, unless you've got a cheap knockoff horrible chip, but even those, I mean, how can you screw up a MOSFET chip? But if you've got a reasonable normal chip that costs at least eight cents, then you don't have to do any sort of grounding of unused inputs in order to make the chip function properly, but it will waste power. So there you go. This is one of those funny little things that you really don't need to know 99.99% .99 of the time, but the other 0.01%, you're gonna be trying to figure out what in the world is going on and why your system is drawing 18 milliamps when it should be drawing two. It's something to try and keep in the back of your mind, sort of like how you shouldn't hook up PNP and NPN transistors in a chain arrangement because they're gonna drive each other, and other little things that I have randomly encountered in the course of my learning. So be aware of MOSFET switching frequency and power draw. Even if you don't have to worry about it, you should still be aware of it. So with that, I'll be seeing you.